Uh, I'd like to move over to Mr. Herman van Rompuy. Hmm. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Van Rompuy. In this series, we are discussing what really matters in markets and the long-term challenges for Europe in an economic sense. Now, Mr. Stiglitz spoke about uh, some good policy measures that can be implemented. He also gave a brief analysis of the current situation. Yet, as we all know, it takes a good political climate for these ideas to come to fruition. And I'd like to discuss that with you. Um, in times of crisis, certain unique opportunities arise, obviously. Uh, our young economists fear, however, that after this corona crisis, we will return back to normal. How likely do you think this is going to be in Europe? First of all, let me say that for me, it's an honor, a pleasure to have a conversation with uh, a real economist. I have a diploma of economist, uh, but I have, I have a lot of respect and admiration even for Professor Stiglitz. He received the Nobel, the Nobel Prize for economics. That was his personal merit. I had the honor to receive the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of the European Union, uh, on behalf of the European Union. <laughs> Uh, so I come back to, uh, to, to the question, back to normal. Uh, let's, let's first uh, realize that the corona crisis is not over. We are in the second wave. Uh, there could be a third wave. Uh, uh, we all hope that there will be a vaccine. It will be later than November, I think. Uh, but there, there will be, we, we will live still one year in a very special, uh, as in a very special situation, and even after that, we can overcome the corona crisis. Uh, there would be, of course, no back to normal, uh, and even before the European the, the corona crisis, we had a lot on our agenda. Also in the European Union, the, the Green Deal and the efforts that the European Union is making for the ecological and digital transformation, it was about transformation. It was not about back to normality. So this is uh, the efforts after the corona crisis will join the efforts that were already on the political agenda uh, before uh, March or February of, uh, of this year. We are in the midst of a transformation process and also for the Europe uh, as, as an economic and monetary union, um, we are at the beginning of uh, the, cre the creation of a, a genuine economic and monetary union. We, we, we realized already parts of the banking union, but there is a huge program for realizing the fiscal union, for realizing the economic union. Uh, so there is a, a lot on, uh, on our agenda already independent of the corona crisis. So back to normality is the worst thing you can say. Of course, there have to be some return to normality uh, in, in the sense that people want to live in a, more, in a, in a, more, in a world with less uncertainty. Uh, we have not the rise of the increase of safe uh, savings rates ratios as we you have in the United States because we have such a, we have a much better social security system. So people uh, are not that anxious uh, compared to the United States. But still, there is a lot of uncertainty about the jobs, uh, about uh, the uh, health, and all those things. Uh, there's also uncertainty about migration. So uncertainty and anxiety are part uh, of our societies. But in general, people want to be to live in a world with much more certainty also after the Corona crisis. And that's something that everybody is longing for. In, in that sense, I can understand what it is normality. Normality is with more security and less anxiety. In times of crisis, not only unique opportunities arise, but also people tend to look at the leaders more for leadership now than ever. What is your general assessment of the leadership that we currently observe uh, within the European Union? I'm much more positive than most people. Um, and we have seen it uh, recently. Um, don't forget that what Germany and France proposed um, in May was implemented two months 
later. So this big initiative of a recovery fund, uh, mainly uh, formed out of, uh, of grants, of subsidies, of transfers, uh, this was something totally new. And that the European Union could borrow money on the capital markets for financing uh, that kind of recovery funds was totally unexpected. And Germany, that, which is heavily criticized, by the way, also in the books of Professor Stieglitz, eh, uh, I think he also was surprised about the initiative taken by Germany. And that those two big countries could agree on, uh, on the recovery uh, fund, uh, and that it was implemented two months later was a major achievement. I was responsible for, for, responsible for managing the Eurozone crisis. It took me and my colleagues two years before we found the turning point. It was in the summer of 2012 when we realized the banking union, parts of it, uh, the uh, super, common su supervision, and then it was uh, uh, the, the, the European Central Bank took this uh, very special, special initiative uh, with the famous words of Mario Draghi. But it took us two years before we could overcome the Eurozone crisis. Here it took us two months before all the 27 countries could agree on such a recovery fund. So this is a, a testimony that's, that leadership, uh, that we can have leadership in the European Union. Uh, the special thing in the European Union is that we have to agree with 27. <laughs> it's, of course, absolutely key that France and Germany can agree, but it is a necessity. There's a sufficient condition, but not an, an, a necessary condition, because we all have to agree. We can only decide in a unanimous way. And we did it after three long nights and four days, but we did it. <laughs> At the same time, um, the, at the EU summit, some critics say it was a hard-fought deal and that um, yeah, some antagonisms arose between the so-called frugal countries and the southern states. And some critics argue at the same time that this shows once again that when push comes to shove, every member state will eventually uh, put its own self-interest first. How does this lack of solidarity square with your optimism? I don't agree. Only the result counts. Of course, there are always debates. And some are uh, emphasizing what we call responsibility to put your house in order. And some are more emphasizing solidarity. And we always have to find a compromise. Uh, but for the future, it's only the result that counts. And history will not recall the long way or the short way to getting to get that kind of compromise. History will only uh, recall the result. And that for me, that's that's the good thing. Uh, and there are different sensitivities in the in the Union between the North and the South, between the West and the East, between the Social Democrats and, and, and the so-called Conservatives. And, and I can give you 20 other examples of, of division. But each time we realized to get a consensus. It was the case in the Eurozone. It was the case when you have uh, to, uh, to find a solution for the refugee crisis. And now uh, after the, the Corona crisis, the, the recovery, and also we, we agreed on, 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 on common solutions. Um, it's always a long way, but I repeat it for the third time, only the result counts. <laughs> Well, that's very clear, Mr. Formupai. Thank you. Um, I have another example that I'd like to discuss with you. Um, when you were president of the European Council, you proposed an EU financial transaction tax for the banking system and for the financial system in, as a whole. Now, almost 10 years later, after you proposed it, it still hasn't come to fruition. Um, isn't that the example that when when we really need to make sure that the financial sector pays up, pays up for the things that it has misdone, um, that the EU has a certain weakness to it and that it, it, it's not able to make sure that these proposals make it and come to full fruition. 
it's one of the few ideas that were not realized. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but uh, you are exaggerate, uh, exaggerating from, from your side. You take one example and say that no, none of our ideas will come to a good end, not at all. Don't forget that uh, the, we, the regulation we put on the banking sector was a very, very tough one. Uh, even much tougher than in the United States. So our, our European banks are complaining that they are too much regulated and that gives them a competitive disadvantage uh, on, the, on the world markets. So we, we regulated uh, them very thoroughly. And by the way, the commissioner responsible for that was Michel Barnier, is now the Brexit negotiator. Uh, and then we, we imposed on the banking sector a single surveillance mechanism uh, uh, under the leadership uh, indirectly of the European Central Bank, which was also something that was a complete novelty. So we, we draw lessons from the banking sector uh, and, and we draw m much more lessons than you are suggesting. The financial transaction tax, um, we, we, there was an experiment. It was an experiment of 10 countries, uh, some kind of coalition of the willing to introduce that kind of tax. And France and, and Germany were on the same page almost. Uh, but uh, after years of negotiations, uh, they didn't succeed. They didn't succeed. The, and th there you see also that uh, even if France and Germany are agreeing, uh, that is not a guarantee for a final success. But there, there was an attempt made um, now there is some some kind, not uh, a Tobin tax, and not really a a, a a financial transaction tax, but some kind of taxation will be introduced. At least that is the expectation. But uh, at, as I said, this was part of a bigger package of controlling the financial sector, which brought us at the brink of a total collapse collapse of the financial system worldwide. Huh? Uh, so we, we, we regulate it heavily, successfully, uh, even if this crisis, the banking sector, is not part of the problem, is part of the solution. So there are many things changed, many things changed uh, since the, bank, the banking crisis of 2009, 2010, but that specific point, we couldn't realize it yet. Yeah, in today's media's climate, loudest the loudest and the shrillest voices often have uh, the, get the most attention, um, which has arguably contributed to our climate of um, the polarization we find ourselves in these days. Um, one of those voices are the extreme right-wing voices. And I have a question here in the chat by Freek, and he wants to ask you, Mr. Verrompuy, um, why do you think that extreme right-wing um, populism is so popular in Europe? And could there be a relationship with uh, neoliberal capitalism? Mm -hmm. There are two major countries in the world that are ruled by populists. That is the UK and the United States. They are ruled by populists today. In the European Union, the populists represent less than 20% of the seats in the European Parliament. So I, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not ignoring the problem, uh, but we have to put it also in the right perspective. Uh, we had one experiment that was in Italy uh, in 2018. There were two populist parties uh, had at that, at that time the, an absolute majority in the Italian parliament. That government collapsed after one year and now they have a, a, a I would even say a traditional uh, government uh, that realized a big thing for Italy eh? because Italy is one of the big winners of the, all the discussions on the recovery uh, fund. And so Italy is again anchored in the Eurozone and in the European Union. The problems are not over. We all, we, we know it. We are very much aware of that. Uh, but the populists are not governing uh, Italy as they are not uh, governing the major countries uh, in, the, in the European Union. But of course, we have to combat populism uh, on the political front, but also in terms of policies. It's not only about politics, it's also about policies. 
And one of the main challenges is how to reconcile our, the openness of our economies, of our societies, of our democracies with this deep need of protection. A lot of people in our societies, they are uncertain, as I said, they are anxious, and they want to be protected against real or perceived threats in our society. Unemployment, unsecured jobs, massive illegal migration, climate change, terrorism, inequalities, fraud and corruption. In some parts of Europe also there is the, the Russian threat. So people want to be better protected and we have to give them that kind of protection. In the Corona crisis it was protecting against, against the, this pandemic and, and providing them with a good good health service. In most of the countries, we succeeded. But how to protect people better whilst maintaining open societies, open democracies, and open economies? That's the big, big challenge. And we can only beat populism when we give them that kind of protection. Thank you very much, Ms. Vorbein. Yes. Yeah. 